In 1799, the notion that children might be rights holders seemed laughable. In that year, the British moralist Hannah Moore made one of the first known references to the concept of children's rights. In an attempt to reveal the absurdity of the egalitarian and libertarian ideas of the Age of Revolution, she wrote, the rights of man have been discussed till we are somewhat wearied with the discussion. To these have been opposed, as the next stage in the process of illumination, the rights of women. It follows, according to the natural progression of human being things, that the next influx of that irradiation, which our enlighteners are pouring upon us, will illuminate the world with grave discants on the rights of youth, the rights of children, and the rights of babies. Even though Moore dismissed the notion of children's rights as ludicrous, she understood that the language of liberty and equality could not be confined solely to the realm of politics or even exclusively to adults. It inevitably influenced ideas and behavior in the private realm as well. What do we mean by the concept children's rights? It refers to the notion that children have a distinct legal identity and interests and needs separate and apart from those of their parents. A broad but somewhat nebulous phrase, children's rights encompasses both protective or dependency rights and civil liberty or autonomy rights. Protective rights refer to the safeguards for children's welfare and well-being. These include the right to a stable home, adequate subsistence, and an education. Civil or liberty rights refer to freedom from state restrictions on a child's liberty or agency. Civil liberties include the right to due process and freedom of expression. In addition, children's rights often implies children's right to have their voices heard and their wishes attended to. What I would like to do is to challenge the notion that the history of children's rights can be understood in linear or progressive terms as a movement from callous indifference to compassion and enlightenment. Rather, this history is best understood in terms of a succession of distinctive legal regimes, each the product of a specific social and intellectual context. Nevertheless, at no point in history has there been a consensus about children's rights. Indeed, the concept has been embraced by groups with very different agendas. The concept has been repeatedly subject to rancorous debate and heated contestation. I will identify five overlapping phases in the history of children's rights in the United States. The first phase, a product of the pre-Civil War decades, involved a recognition of children's special needs to maternal nurture, education, and time to mature. This era saw a host of innovations reflecting the notion that children were the mere image of adults, dependent rather than autonomous, innocent and malleable in ways that adults were not. This viewpoint found expression in new legal doctrines, including the best interests of the child, and new social institutions, including the House of Correction, the Juvenile Reformatory, and the public school. A second phase, which arose in the decades following the Civil War, emphasized child protection. In this era, heightened awareness of the perils posed by child abuse and neglect and other threats to children's well-being prompted the emergence of the first societies to prevent cruelty to children, an enactment of measures to censor obscenity, and raise the age of consent for sexual activity. A third phase, which began during the progressive era and extended through the New Deal, greatly extended the definition of childhood to age 17 and stressed the notion that all children, irrespective of class, have a right to a middle-class definition of a protected, dependent childhood. The movement to abolish child labor, extend welfare payments to mothers with dependent children, and expand access to kindergartens and high schools were products of this phase of reform. A fourth phase in the 1960s and early and mid-1970s placed a heightened stress on children's autonomy rights, including the right of freedom of speech and expression and the right to make decisions that have a substantial impact on their lives, such as abortion. We are now in the midst of a fifth phase 
in which the courts and legislatures strive to achieve a balance between children's autonomy rights and child protection. The justifications for and legal and institutional approaches to children's rights have taken very different forms in distinct historical eras. Sometimes advocates of children's rights have argued that such rights are best promoted through institutional segregation of children, at other times through inclusion and mainstreaming. Sometimes children's rights have been defended on the grounds of children's competence, at other times on the grounds that children's immaturity and lack of brain development mandate special protection. As we will see, the history of children's rights is a story replete with ironies and contradictions. One striking irony is that many of our contemporary notions of children's rights arose partly in reaction to earlier state actions that were intended to promote children's welfare. One generation's reforms were subsequently viewed by a later de generation as detrimental to children's rights. A second conspicuous irony is that an expansion of children's rights has sometimes had consequences that are the opposite of what reformers anticipated. A notable example is that criticisms of the juvenile justice system had the unexpected effect of expanding the likelihood that juveniles would be charged as adults. A third noticeable irony is that the concept of children's rights has often been invoked to expand the power of adults, including judges, attorneys, caseworkers, and child welfare agencies, sometimes without actually expanding children's voice or agency in legal proceedings. The term children's rights is not a new one. In the decades before the Civil War, the phrase entered the American vocabulary. But from the very beginning, the phrase had two contradictory meanings. On the one hand, the expression referred to the notion that children have special needs and interests that adults are obligated to protect. Children, according to this view, are fragile, vulnerable, malleable creatures who require proper nurture, protection, play, schooling, and time to mature. On the other hand, the phrase also suggests that children had a distinctive personhood and a unique legal identity and status separate and apart from those of their parents and deserved a degree of autonomy in their actions. The conception of children as weak, vulnerable, defenseless creatures gave rise to three legal principles with profound consequences for the future, all before the Civil War. One was the best interest of the child doctrine, which held that children's welfare should be the preeminent consideration in any judicial decision involving children's care. A second principle was the tender years doctrine, that young children were best left to their mother's care. The third principle was parents patria, that the courts had the authority to override parents' custody rights. Each of these doctrines gave judges broad discretion to grant custody as they saw fit, allowing them to take into account their perception of parents' fitness. Judicial discretion, however, also meant that decisions could easily reflect various forms of bias based on racial, gender, ethnic, or class prejudice. Other innovations of this formative era included a new legal concept, adoption, the first organized campaigns against corporal punishment in schools, and new institutions to promote the welfare of dependent and delinquent children. Meanwhile, from the 1790s through the 1840s, reformers created congregate institutions to separate children from the corruptions of the public world and provide them with the order and discipline that their families lacked. Rapid urban growth, immigration, and the breakdown of the apprenticeship system greatly increased the number of dependent children, and institutionalization appeared to be the most cost-effective response. But institutionalization also reflected new ideas about childhood. The binding out or public auctioning of poor or orphan children clashed with a sentimental view of the child as an innocent creature who needed care and nurture. Meanwhile, 
a heightened emphasis on 